Good afternoon. That was some good technical teamwork. <laughs> good afternoon. I'm Mary Gray. I'm the director of the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. And on behalf of the OAC board and staff and the gallery team, welcome. Today marks the sixth of eight talk, artist talks during the run of our 2017 Biennial Juried Exhibition that runs through January 6th. All talks are streamed on Facebook Live, so if you miss one, they are available for viewing at your convenience on the Ohio Arts Council's Facebook page and the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Facebook page. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Nate Ricciuto. I got it! Today's guest artist. <laughs> Nate Ricciuto, I get to say it again. Uh, his projects merge sculpture, image, glass, and performative objects in questioning the expectations we bring to technology. Nate earned his MFA from Tyler School of Art in 2015 and a BFA from The Ohio State University in 2008. He is currently a lecturer in the Department of Art at Ohio State University and is recipient of the 2017 Individual Excellence Award from the Ohio Arts Council. Now, those of you who know you and your wife, our OAC colleague, Brianna Dance, we believe your collaboration, your collaborative project entitled Baby Phoebe <laughs> is your best and finest work to date. <laughs> Please welcome Nate. Cool. Thank you very much, Mary. And thank you, Kim, for all your work on the exhibition. Um, I was really excited to be a part of this, been to the right many times, and it's cool to be able to show some things in here, um, and to be a part of this artist talk series. Um, it's also really great to have some close friends and uh, teachers, longtime supporters in the audience, so I'm uh, happy to get into this. My name's Nate Ricciuto. We had some fun with the pronunciation beforehand. We got it all hammered out. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the piece that's in here and kind of an overall uh, trajectory to some degree also. I do work with glass, as uh, Mary said. And this is some work that I created a while ago um, using molds to create kiln cast cinder blocks that are full-scale recreations of the thing itself. So just sort of an initial interest in kind of recasting these ordinary objects as something a little bit mysterious and a little bit, uh, you know, whimsical or magical, if I can use that terminology. And it looks like our conversion to PDF destroyed all my image quality, but um, it'll give you a basic idea, hopefully, of some of these things. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Dorothy, uh, who's in the audience here, Dorothy Gill Barnes, and I'm so happy that you could be here today. Uh, the work that I have in this show involves um, actually some material that Dorothy gave me and um, some of the process and, and things that I have learned working with her over the years. So this is from 2009 when Dorothy was a resident artist at Ohio State, and myself and a few other people, uh, Shahid Khan, one of my good friends, are helping her flap a big patty of hot glass onto a wooden thing and then slam metal things on it. So you can see that bottom <laughs> and she's getting in there. Um, you know, she's, not too, uh, she's not too afraid to get in there and get dirty. And that's kind of um, something that's been an inspiration to my work and to me over the years is some of uh, you know Dorothy's ability to kind of find things to exploit in raw materials and sort of reveal some um, things that may be overlooked or um, you know not focused on. So this is a work that she created that does have some glass involved in it. Um, and then I wanted to show just a couple of uh, process shots from the um, artwork surrogate activities that's on the wall over there because um, these are some of the tricks that I've kind of learned working with Dorothy. She'll be like, I have this chunk of wood or this piece of bark and we just need to get it to <laughs> do something. So in this case, it's uh, you know reforming something that was in a curly cue kind of into a cylindrical shape. 
Um, keep going. Uh, this is some more some more glass work from several years ago, kind of around 2012, 2014. Um, and these are pieces moving into, you know, still working with objects, but kind of moving into uh, highlighting the importance of process or illustrating the way that uh, objects can kind of um, be stand-ins for a process that is happening on a different time scale. Um, so this one on the left is kind of an approximation of a distilling device that doesn't really work, and then we have a glass funnel with uh, concrete flowing out of it to create a pedestal for it. Oh, these also reordered some. So this is sort of just a comparison of different ideas of what could be considered real, um, and also maybe looking a little bit more uh, away from objects and into the landscape. So these are some things. Uh, the top one is a billboard that's along 71, and the bottom one is a, a cellular phone tower disguised as a tree. Uh, that was in New Jersey, I believe. <laughs> I've circled it for your convenience. <laughs> um, it's kind of hard to spot. So I wanted to sort of go into um, kind of some of the ideas that I was thinking of uh, as work becomes more playful and more about investigating your surroundings and figuring out the ways that I find interesting to interact with materials and objects and spaces. Um, this is uh, when I lived in Philadelphia to go to graduate school. This is how they fix the road. So I was, was uh, you know, found those things amusing, but also sort of interesting in a kind of um, way that you're just getting it done. You do what you gotta do, and um, sometimes that's funny and interesting also, I think. And this is a periscope that I made that you could observe the space inside the drop ceiling. I started to think about some of that space inside the drop ceiling as um, this sort of literal separate space, a kind of concealed bubble of possibility within an existing structure. Um, this was something I made that allowed me to send notes up to myself in an elevated loft that I created. Um, and I mean, I'm still pretty interested in using my studio as kind of a laboratory, just making things as a way to think through different ideas. Um, and some things become finished work and some things become ideas that have other permutations. This is a work from the 2014 architecture of Venice Biennale. Um, by an architect named Rem Koolhaas, where he sort of created this cross-section of a building concealing the, um, the very ornate dome that was in this uh, palace in Venice with a, sort of the infrastructural building parts that would be in a modern building. It's sort of, it's a, but you can walk up to this thing and kind of see the space in this exploded view. Um, and I started to think a lot more about the, that um, elevated and concealed, concealed space as kind of a, um, you know, a possibility to contain some meaning and uh, different symbolic purposes. Um, I like to talk a little bit in, when I speak about the way that the work develops um, about Buckminster Fuller also. Um, this is uh, from the 1967 um, World's Fair in Montreal, and uh, it's a geodesic dome, which he's kind of famous for. He didn't invent, but it's an idea that he popularized, and it, uh, he touted it in this very idealistic, progressive way as um, the most efficient way to cover the most amount of space with the least resources. So it's kind of this uh, altruistic vision of um, 1960s futurism that I'm very interested in. Um, and I'm also interested in the way that those things kind of transition through time. So this is another instance of um, using the geodesic structures to create sort of a separate space. And this is a drop city commune from, uh, I believe this is like early 1970s, 1973, 75. Um, and it was a people that decided to kind of leave the city and create a separate space for themselves in the um, west 
uh, as it were. But also, you know, I'm pretty interested in the idea of that using this alternative architecture as a way to kind of redefine, step outside of the system. Um, and then now, if anybody has tried to build a geodesic dome, which I've seen a lot of them recently, you've probably seen this website um, with a little pun there. Um, but this is a website created by somebody who makes domes for Burning Man, which is this sort of countercultural festival in the desert. Um, and I sort of am very interested in the way that that idea or, you know, the, the um, symbolism of the structure sort of changes and gets co-opted by different purposes and meanings um, to be this kind of spectacle. But also in, um, you know, this use of the internet as a, uh, as a kind of access to a lot of different types of uh, knowledge or skills. Um, so I created a eight foot, uh, eight foot wide, four foot high geodesic dome that I um, inserted into the drop ceiling structure in a gallery. I was invited to do a site specific commission. Um, and I created this piece made out of the drop ceiling tiles um, to sort of interrupt that um, plane that's essentially supposed to be an invisible barrier that conceals all of the things that make the space work that you just don't need to know about. Um, so it's, you know, it's from below, kind of just this strange dome, and then up above you can see it as a kind of mysterious uh, encampment in an alien landscape, I like to think of it as. Where is it right um, now? What's that? Mind asking, where is that right now? Oh, it's uh, it's nowhere, mostly <laughs> because the drop ceiling material is like this fibrous mess, um, and it was kind of only meant to live for a little bit of time, <laughs> so it, it uh, basically crumbled and had to be discarded. But um, I mean, that other that material yeah. is. Um, it's cheap and lightweight, so it's kind of you know that's another um, thing about it that I'm interested in is that it is sort of this idea of a prefab um, system that you can kind of just throw up in any any place. So you know I kind of think of that project in the same way. If I wanted to just put it in another place, I have the kind of like math of how what the sizes of the different things need to be, and you just kind of cut them out and slap it together. That's the potential of that. Um, these are just some other studio shots, but I wanted to include this one. Uh, this was a project that I worked on. It's kind of just like a mess of things. Um, but this was more like a little bit of a social experiment that I did with students. I um, created a little box that I hung on the wall, and then each day I would make a little sculpture or find a little useful object to put in it, and it was kind of an exchange. I don't know if you guys have seen those, like, little libraries that sometimes people have on the street corner that you can take a book, leave a book. But it was that with art projects, so. Or, you know, tubes of oil paint that I found. Um, or bags of tea. There's different, different kinds of useful things. Um, you know, but this did sort of, sort of get me thinking about creating, um, you know, things that operate in larger spaces, but then also the way that those things can be contained in smaller containers, which is kind of the, um, the log on the wall thing that I have going on down the way there. Um, this is an image that I like to pull up from uh, Paradise Garden in Georgia, which is um, this guy named Howard Finster created this sort of environment for himself over um, you know, sort of like the course of a lifetime. Um, and I'm very interested in, you know, this kind of like material need to uh, create a lot of things and sort of transform your, your world by, um, you know, just like repetitive doing or and all these things. And I think it also has, you know, I, I find influences coming in with a lot of um, collage and using found objects and things like that. It's uh, just a very interesting, inspiring, kind of quirky thing that plays into some of the projects I've worked on. 
This is an installation I created um, called Examples of Opposition Effect. Um, and there was a video, which probably won't work on this PDF, but we'll, I'll talk more to compensate. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about this space as, as sort of a set or a stage um, where you could observe it from outside, but also go in um, and interact with these different things. And that's a video. I'm imagining it. Um, so, but it's also sort of kind of supposed to be this um, imagined space or unreal, um, low budget sci fi set type of idea um, where these glass lenses, these are uh, blown glass spheres that are filled with water to create like a magnifying and distorting lens. So there's, they were scattered around the space along with these um, different mirrored angles and things like that. So that as you go around the space, you sort of are able to experience the view in different ways. Um, and, you know, in some ways it is meant to look like there is a character or something that's supposed to inhabit these places. Um, but then there's also the invitation for you to um, kind of step in and imagine yourself or what you would do with, uh, you know, this little sort of segmented garden. Um, and this is Brianna, this is here also. <laughs> I get to embarrass her a little bit. Um, she's utilizing one of the sculptures that was kind of deployed in this space, we'll say. Um, but this is tying some strings to different types of uh, delusional activities, I guess, which I'll kind of work back into later on. So this is a device meant to help you find the, you know, there's a book that you can sort of scout out the locations for these different disguised uh, cellular towers. Um, and then there's some spray paint where you can mark your way. Um, so kind of really connecting these, uh, the activity of making to the different activities that, that people would, um, you know, have to sort of engage with to think about the way these things are used. Uh, there's also a large rotating light sculpture that flashed on and off, um, kind of like a signal, or I also would say that it seems in some ways like a generator that kind of um, encapsulates the energy of this sort of uh, stage set. Throwing in some natural materials, there's a little uh, tree branch there. Um, and I have a couple of artists that I'll say a few things about as I go through some of this later work. Um, this is a project of Robert Smithson's from 1969, uh, Mirror Displacements 1 through 9. He um, followed the journey of a uh, late 19th century explorer in the Yucatan in Mexico um, that, that sort of charted this uh, course through the jungle and did all this explaining about what he found. And Robert Smithson was interested in kind of just refollowing these steps, retracing these steps, and then uh, placing mirrors in the ground and, um, you know, basically calling attention to his experience of going to this place and being displaced from the things that he's used to as, um, you know, a very kind of individual and subjective one. Um, really sort of exploding the idea of a, uh, a sort of reliable historical account by a person that's explaining something um, for future um, knowledge. And then this is a piece from Gabriel, Gabriel Orozco, uh, who happens to be a Mexican artist. Um, from the mid-90s called Yielding Stone, he uh, basically just balled up a bunch of uh, oil clay, plasticine, and would go around New York City and um, roll it on things or otherwise interact with it. It collected debris, um, and he would photograph it in various ways. So I really became interested in um, you know the idea of the action being kind of the, the meat of the artwork and how this... Uh, process of documentation and then also, you know, traces of, um, you know, accumulating different uh, parts of the environment into the work could function. 
Ooh. Oh, I got excited for a second because this one actually, this was, is a video. <laughs> is was, it is was a video. Um, but these are some, I can tell that Dorothy's really enjoying this one. <laughs> I wish I could remember what I was listening to. Um, but those are uh, binocular, um, I guess we'll call them headgear, <laughs> kaleidoscope binocular headgear that I created um, as just kind of a way of re-envisioning your surroundings. It's something that you can um, you know, choose to take on or um, engage with. Uh, and this was part of a residency I did in New Jersey um, in 2016 at a place called Wheaton Arts that really gave me a lot of uh, freedom and time to you know work on a lot of things that sort of I guess happened over a little a little while and then also become sort of an object and then something that I would use to also engage with uh, the landscape or my surroundings so I made it this um, tricycle that you ride that then the the uh this mirrored partially mirrored hemisphere spins really slowly on the back of it and you'll see a little bit more of this um thing further on this is also a display that i created for those um binoculars that i made um and i guess you know this is included as as sort of a way that i think about sometimes uh, the process of making things as a kind of research and um, doing that later I have to think about how it sort of gets displayed and becomes something that people will encounter in a gallery or in some other kind of space. Um, but I see these things as a little bit of um, flux where they're, they're kind of one thing at one time and something else at another. This is an instance where you can't really get in there and like experience those um, kaleidoscope binoculars, you have to just kind of imagine what it would be like. This is a um, mirrored shed drawing, and I th this is kind of thinking a little bit more about how imagery comes into um, some of these processes and working with objects in different ways. Um, another thing that sort of factors into the ideas that um, this surrogate activities, which I can't wait to kind of explain that um, title a little bit, but this is the next Whole Earth Catalog, um, which this, the tagline of this is Access to Tools, and this was published in 1980. The original um, Whole Earth Catalog was pub published in 1970. These are um, basically um, do it your early do it yourself sustainability manuals. They're uh, kind of a a handbook for homesteading or um, living off the grid. I guess is like probably the easiest way to encapsulate it. So they have you know everything from um, user submitted articles about collecting water in a rural area, which is what this page is. Um, different ways to create pumps to, to extract water from the ground without um, using electricity. Um, low cost architecture, there was a, and the original one had a large section on geodesic domes because that was all the rage until they figured out you couldn't keep them from leaking. Um, they're prettier than they are functional. Um, but I'm also pretty interested in this as it sort of deals with, um, or as a precursor to things like YouTube and other um, do-it-yourself uh, networks that exist now where there is knowledge sharing and skill sharing and things like that that happen, um, you know, a little bit fluidly. These are some ways that the internet helps me to accomplish all the things I need to do in my busy life like make craters, <laughs> birthday parties for them. This is, but the NASA website is really great. I can't wait till Phoebe's old enough to like uh, make some science projects <laughs> of flour and sugar. Uh, this is another video. It <laughs> rotates. So I created a um, kind of a maquette of one of these uh, water extraction devices, a chain pump that um, with some 
uh, glass and ping pong balls. So I'm also interested in kind of smushing some of those materials together that read in different ways, glass being something that um, requires a lot of skill and sort of time investment and then uh, throwing in ping pong balls and other uh, you know, dollar store items. This is a little stove. So this one I will explain because the video is kind of great. This is a water droplet, a uh, water droplet in the middle of a um, little alcohol stove that I created out of beer cans. And the water droplet rolls around um, the edge of this nickel in there because of the convection of the heat. Um, and I just kind of love it. And I like showing it and it gets oohs and ahs. Um, but this thing is, it is also kind of a, an inconsequential object that I find, um, you know, mysterious and sort of lives in this um, document. But then it is nothing else. This is uh, an image of the Unabomber cabin from uh, Montana. Uh, when actually, in the when the FBI managed to catch up with them and are um, kind of taking it apart and all that stuff. But to go back to the whole Earth catalog, I sort of became interested in the and Ted Kaczynski for a few reasons. I had. Um, read some of this manifesto that he published while he was in prison that um, is called Industrial Society and Its Future, um, which sort of is really um, making the claim that we need to um, really go back to simpler times, that all of these um, technological advances and um, corporations running the world and exploiting natural resources and all of these things are just like um, ruining um, human existence and that we kind of need to go back. Obviously, he took a um, you know pretty radical tact with some of his ideas, um, but I was interested in this sort of um, idea of like, when have we gone too far, and how, how far do you need to think outside of the system to um, accomplish something meaningful, or, um, you know, now it's like they're, the uh, present political situation, they're shrinking all the national monuments, and, you know, so these things have some other um, interesting tie-ins, but he was also a tinker who made a lot of his own tools um, and kind of uh, was able to was able to like do these kind of things that he wanted to do in complete isolation without electricity and so on and so forth. The um, the piece on the wall here that's called Surrogate Activities is taken from one of his um, writings, um, and I think of that little concealed space as kind of this little bubble of a um, you know that another. A delusional reality can like exist inside of that thing. So there are these sort of little models and maquettes in there, and then because they have this um, contained sort of disguised presence, they're able to uh, proliferate, if you will. Another shot of the uh, beer can stove. Um, I'll go through a few other things here. That's a uh, non-functional radio uh, telemetry backpack that you can wear if you choose. This is another video. Um, but this is also an object. So it's a video and an object. Um, and this is a little attic space that I created. Um, another another tie-in with uh, the Unabomber, I suppose, is that I was really fascinated with um, his construction of his little cabin in the woods. He, um, he actually found the plans for his 10 by 15 cabin um, in the first Whole Earth Catalog, which published uh, Henry, David Thoreau, uh, Henry David Thoreau's um, specifications from the cabin that he built on Walden Pond in Massachusetts in the 1850s. So um, Henry David Thoreau is kind of this character who practiced a, um, 
a simplified, deliberate life in a time when, um, you know, basically the United States was kind of becoming what it is now. And he was saying, like, well, we need to kind of step back, go into the woods and, and figure out who we really are. Um, and, but then also he sort of becomes a model for all of these other people that seclude themselves from society, um, find isolation in the wilderness, um, but have sort of very different means and different ends. Um, so this is a personal um, scale model of um, Henry David Thoreau's attic, which you can stand underneath kind of like an outhouse. And I still have to build an outhouse for Dorothy, so that's another thing we have to talk about <laughs> in a minute. This is um, another kind of iteration of this idea of thinking about the um, the sort of specifications of the cabin that Henry David Thoreau built and then the way that the that uh, Unabomber um, co-opted these architectural um, ideas for different purposes. I created this installation in the spring this year for Western Art Gallery in Cincinnati. Um, and this is a um, nine foot tall tiered, um, it's kind of like a set of stairs or it looks a bit like a fragment of a pyramid. Um, and it's called Rise Over Run Again um, because it's meant to sort of um, call to mind the idea of the pitch of a roof or, um, and this is an image of the piece that's in the gallery displayed in this space. Um, but the space underneath the um, stair structure is, is meant to be a little bit of an attic or a personal space, kind of like a, a workshop environment um, where you have that enclosed space, but then you also have the stair step structure um, sort of calling attention to the, the, you know, basically the math that is used to create this um, attic space that would normally be something um, that's concealed and rather functional and, uh, you know, not that interesting, but maybe it holds or conceals some rather interesting things. Nate, where was that installed? Was it in the West End? Was it downstairs? Uh, no, it's a, it was in the, was the street level okay. space. Huh. Yeah. I'll show a couple more images from, <coughs> from that. Yeah, it's kind of a, a curious space, yeah. the upstairs. The lighting's good on it. Um, these are some of the other objects that were in there. These are um, sort of um, abstracted ideas of tools. These are little signal mirrors created from slide cases and then a uh, another little thing like made with some chopsticks. The uh, tricycle makes another appearance as a suspended uh, automated machine um, that also um, exists in video. <laughs> um, but in this case it's it became um, the sort of delineated space in the middle of the gallery that that looked it was on display as if it was in a museum or you know I mean in this case even some sort of like science museum um, but I call this piece the time machine and it um, you know in a lot of ways is meant to reference the way that these uh, sort of different images and archetypes that I've used are shift and um, become co-opted in different ways And then I think this is the last image I'll show since um, I have other videos. Um, this was another work for that space that also deals a little bit with um, things like sci-fi imagery or imagined worlds, um, and but also architecture and public spaces. This is, um, you know, there are some kind of formal tie-ins with the stair step structure. This is a uh, park designed by Philip Johnson, um, which is in Fort Worth, Texas, called the Water Gardens. And what initially drew me to it was that it was used in the uh, filming of a sci-fi film called Logan's Run um, in the mid-70s. And in that instance, they, they portrayed this public park with, that's essentially a fountain. Um, as the power generating source for the city. It was supposed to be filtering and generating power for this futuristic city, um, you know, while the characters kind of frolic around on here. Um, but 
I had it uh, directly printed on these panels of plywood, so it, it sort of is, um, you know, giving a little bit of a juxtaposition of of this imagined idea of an imagined space, of a space that exists in cinema, and then slapping it on some um, hardware store wood where you can still see the wood grain, and then it's cropped to um, reveal that kind of uh, segmented nature of that space also, that it is a, um, it's this well in the center of what would be um, in an urban environment. Um, well, that's a video too, but, it's, but that's a little mysterious night photo that we can look at um, to finish. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? I meant to say that at the beginning, I think, but please ask as many as you want. Throwing a lot of uh, odds and ends at you. So That's what's happens. next for you? Exhibition lines, projects? Um, yeah, well, I'm actually um, working now and I'm doing a collaborative project with a with a friend of mine who's a printmaker. Um, it'll be a show in, in Philadelphia in February, um, and we're sort of going off of um, some of the things that I'm thinking about with the last uh, plywood printed imagery piece. Um, we're, we're going to be creating an installation that has some things that are a little bit more ecologically minded and has some things to do with uh, highlighting different uh, imagery and practices of uh, mining and resource extraction. Um, so she does a lot with uh, printing on fabric and things like that, so it'll be a combination of um, printed imagery and fabric and some uh, glass structure and other construction type things that I will be contributing. Um, and then I'm also planning to um, reinstall the stair step structure um, at Roy G. Biv in February, so it'll be hopefully um, reformatted and kind of um, fleshed out in some different ways, but that is a, um, that's the plan <laughs> for now. Great. Thank yeah, thanks. Question. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, um, yeah like uh, the stairs, the, that installation, I was just curious about your aesthetic, um, it looks like you're carrying too much animosity with the, the color, the neon, sort of um, the punch of that, I, I think it, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, I guess what I would say about that is that I do think about the playful nature of these things and that, um, you know, I do want to invite participation and interaction, and I think some of that is, there is, uh, you know, an element of spectacle or silliness when there are, like, spinning light structures and, um, you know, zigzag lines and things like that, I think, um, are kind of like important invitations for engagement. I guess that's the way I think of it. And then, you know, even those kind of like bold red um, diagonal lines on the um, stair step structure, I, you know, I sort of think of them as like the, um, the way road lines or the way tread lines function as a, as a sort of like a path making or a way finding. Um, symbol but it's something that you know kind of goes nowhere essentially it's it's meant to hint at those uh, you know maybe road lines or maybe the the uh, kind of diagonal things on the highway off ramp um, I wish I knew the chevrons um, but then also I like to I mean what your question made me think of was um, you know in that installation there were some of those um, tie-ins about thinking thinking some about like a character like Ted Kaczynski or different kinds of, um, you know, more subversive or, or uh, less palatable types of, um, you know, rebellion. And I think that they're, I like it if the works can function on those levels where they're like childlike and wondrous maybe um, and invite investigation, but then also, um, you know, there, if you want to dig into it, there are some kind of um, threads of, of uh, 
more serious commentary, I guess, is the way I would put it. So, bright colors and weird stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Applying pigment directly to raw plywood sounds like temporary. Is that how you conceived it? Um, well, it was uh, done with an inkjet printer, so I think that there is that. Um, I don't think it's exactly archival. Um, I, I would think that I could get plywood that, that um, you know, would have less of those kind of noxious materials in it than um, that would degrade the ink over time. But I don't, but it doesn't like rub off or anything like that. Um, but, you know, and you say- Short term <laughs> rather than temporary. Yeah, but in you saying that I do, you know, I do kind of think, um, you know, there, there certainly is a fastness to it where, um, you know, it's an image that's taken from the internet and then basically like running a sheet of plywood through a huge inkjet printer. Um, and while that's like, you know, maybe not as costly as you would think, it's, um, it's not like going to Kinko's and printing off eight and a half by 11. Um, Home Depot. Home Depot, but, it, but it is, um, but it is also kind of, it's something that I could see, you know, functioning in a way like putting up the geodesic dome or something like that, where it is formulaic and that you have these sort of things and they're easily reproducible um, and could be formatted in different ways quickly. So, yes. More questions? <laughs> What's up? Do I have time um, still? Yep, yeah, you're good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm really curious about the videos. Is there a place where we can see them? <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, all, I think I have all of my videos on Vimeo, um, streaming site, so they're all, like, if you just, um, you know, search for my name, Nate Ruchito, on Vimeo, they're all there. Um, but then also, on, I have a website, which is nateruchito.com, which I suppose for <coughs> ease of, uh, you know, it's not the easiest thing to spell, which is maybe the downside, but the upside <laughs> is that if you Google it, there is nobody else. Um, so that's kind of a uh, mixed bag there. And my other question is, what kind of artwork did you start out making? Um, I, I guess I would say that I started out with uh, photography. Um, I Early, early on, started make, when I started making, um, you know, I guess what I considered to be artwork, I got pretty invested in kind of the black and white darkroom process, um, and you know, was interested in the way that photography can kind of like create its own context and um, you know, really highlight some of the um, common or ordinary things that we don't attention to but maybe could be shifted in such a way to work with an idea. Time for one more question. Could you talk about your outhouse with building <laughs> Well it's sort of hypothetical, but we have a we do have a toilet seat. Um, and we and we have a, a roof. So I think we're slowly compiling the um, the yeah, elements. Time to get over there and get and, we, and time, yeah. <laughs> Dorothy and has a. Will it be usable? Oh, certainly. Oh, and maybe you know, outhouses always have those uh, you know quotas of how many people it could support for a normal work week. So <laughs> I <laughs> I wouldn't give you any guarantees there, but um, the certainly. The safe part is where one of our dogs has been buried, and so we have. Where that was. Oh. So we have to find the buried dog and then <laughs> go from there. Got I'm comfortable with that. Well, that's a great note to end on. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming.